I am thrilled this evening because we've got an unbelievably complex topic that everybody in wine uses this phrase. Very few people know exactly what it means. We're going to distill that down this evening because this is SIP episode 101. 101, ladies and gentlemen, that you have put up with us, invited us into your living rooms, your patios, your family rooms, your kitchens, your RVs. Uh, so thank you for all of that. And thank you for that kindness. I do want to let you know, my name is Martin Cody. I am the co-founder of Cellar Angels. We are a direct-to-consumer wine company. We specialize exclusively in Napa and Sonoma wines. And many of the people here are drinking this wine that we're going to have this evening because they purchased a sip kit on the Cellar Angels website. So if you have not gone to the Cellar Angels website, you definitely need to. Because on the marketplace, you go to shop, you go to wine, you can hit the marketplace, you'll see a collection of the SIP kit. The SIP kit is just one of many ways to get these small limited production wineries into your hands, but it will have four or five wines for the next consecutive four or five Fridays. And that way you can drink along with the winemakers, the people that made the wine, and you can ask them questions, interact with them, learn about the topic. But tonight, not only do we have April and Andrew Nall, we are drinking their Ranch Red, Big Ranch Red. Um, and I've had a lot to drink, and I don't mean wine. We got a new coffee maker today, and I've been drinking coffee all freaking day. So I need everybody to listen very, very fast. Those cute little espresso, you can make like six of those in 10 minutes. Those have a <laughs> lot of power behind them. So uh, be careful. But we're going to discuss tannins this evening. And before we discuss tannins, I want to actually read a little bit about tannin. Do not go to sleep on me on this one because it is extremely complex. Tannins are polyphenolic metabolites commonly found in higher plants. They are considered secondary metabolites, not directly involved in the growth or development or the reproduction of the plant. Tannin is derived from grapes as well as oak from the barrel. And they contribute and come from a class of compounds that have the textural properties, color attributes, bitterness, and aging capacity of wines. All come from tannin. The textural sensation in your mouth is from tannin, and it's often referred to as astringency. But here's where that one common denominator comes in, where people have described tannins as if you were sucking on a black tea bag, or you have peanut butter stuck to the roof of your mouth. That tactile perception of astringency is due to both hydrophobic and hydrogen bonding interactions between saliva and proteins in the wine tannin. And when the proteins precipitate out of the solution, resulting in a loss of lubrication in the mouth, that is literally almost as deep as we're gonna get. We're gonna get a little deeper later on, but I want to introduce our guests this evening who have stood patiently by while I told you everything that they do for a living. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a huge heartwarming joy to welcome guests from episode 25, 76 episodes ago, back to the program, April and Andrew Nall. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll do it. Cheers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yeah. It's fun to be here talking this topic. I can't believe it's been that long. I, I can't I know. It. It's, it's crazy. That just lets you know how long a pandemic is. But um, <laughs> wow, we're still here. So still here. I did want to also, before we get into tannins, I want to talk a little bit about your side project. Yeah. We are West Side. So if you are looking for a rosé that is going to taste good and make you feel good, this is it. And I bring this to your attention because it's from April's daughter's kindergarten class. Or so, I April, why don't you tell the story? Yeah, yeah. So um, the art is, well, um, it's a public school. And now um, a lot of the enrichment programs, including PE, art, Spanish, gardening, all have to be, um, we have to raise money for those programs to continue uh, every year. And so we thought, you know, let's make some, we make rosé. So this is our 2021 Zin rosé. It's delicious, uh, refreshing, and has nice, bright acidity, but deep, deep kind of a Zin berry pops. But um, anyway, so we labeled about um, very little, about 30 cases of this to sell. 100% of the proceeds will go to back to um, Westside Kindergarten. 
to fund these um, these programs. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of Pep Talk. It mm -hmm. kind of got bit pretty famous. Yeah. It's um, a young. You call this number, but these young kids will give you a little pep talk, like, "Oh, if you're feeling down, go buy shoes." Or I want to do one that says, "If you're feeling down, open a nice bottle of wine." <laughs> but um, it is. But, I, yeah. I not only purchased a case, uh, Mission Control and I bought a case, and we've called the number a couple of times. I've turned friends onto that number, yeah. and it is. For those of you that remember the Butterball Turkey Hotline, where the little kids call in to tell you how to cook a turkey, it's like that and even funnier. Uh, and there are two cases left in the Cellar Angels inventory. And so if anybody wants to hit the chat and say, I'll take the case, you don't have to do a thing. We will transact that order for you. But I would love to sell those two cases. And I promise you, if you call that number, you will laugh. It will make your heart sink. Uh, yeah. So that is one of the greatest things. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, April. Yeah, thank you, guys. All right, so let's let's dive into Tana because especially with Napa and Sonoma having soils that are some of the best in the world and it's so diverse. We talk about it often when we do Google Google Earth about how it's a Mediterranean climate, but tannin management is extremely important that I don't think gets a, a lot of attention, but you guys pay particularly close attention to it. So Andrew, kind of walk us through at a high level what tannin means to you and how you essentially weave that into wine production. Yeah, so I feel like tannin is the structure, is the main mid-body, the makeup of the real wine and what you, the sensation that you feel as you you drink it. And that goes a, a long way. Um, the steps that start from all the way in the vineyard to the finished wine. Um, you know, we're mostly making Zinfandel. This has some Cabernet in it, which Cabernet, um, it depends on the soil, but also depends on the varietal. So Cabernet uh, genetically has a more tannic, um, is a more tannic species. And then Zinfandel is more like Pinot Noir in the, in the way. Um, but also you, you don't want to pick the fruit uh, underripe because you'll get green kind of green peppercorn tannins and you don't want to pick it over right because you get kind of pruney more drying tannins and also the whole way that you're processing the wine when it comes into the winery right we sort out any uneven ripening to then how we de-stem it where we 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 don't crush the berries we we kind of keep them whole and we don't pump over a lot and we have these big open top fermenters kind of like a pinot but it's zinfandel and then cab and so we're really careful with our maceration and, and then the whole process of then getting into barrels and finishing the fermentation in barrels so the oak will kind of soften the tannins. And we use French oak, well, which oak also has, has tannins, softer yeah. tannins. Yeah. So those oak tannins right. will, will counteract any of the, 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 uh, the grape tannins. And so then- right, let's, yeah. let's pause yeah. there for a second because this is where tannins can get very, very complex. But before I dive back into tannins, I need to educate folks on null. So April, why don't you reacquaint some of the folks that are familiar with you from episode 25 and a lot of new folks right now that may not know anything about null and your limited production history because it's one of the more impressive wine stories in the Valley. Yeah, um, uh, well, we are a small family winery. His mother, this, this property is, has been in his mother-in-law's family since 1917. And we started the first vintage of Nall in 1984. So I've been doing it a long time. And we really make a small production, 25, around 2,500 cases. And we say we're do it all Nall because we do it all ourselves. We're out in the vineyard. Andrew, it's pretty rare, I would say, to have the actual owners and winemakers doing the cellar work. I mean, Andrew's in the cellar every single day. I was just out in the vineyard tying and um, topping and... So we know this this estate these estate blocks really well. <laughs> I mean, I think it's in I think it's in Andrew's DNA by this Please. point. Plus, um, that's what we love to do. We love yeah. the hands-on, yeah. the winemaking and the production side. That's how we got into it. And that's why we're still doing it because we get up every day and we get to use our, yeah. our body and our hands to create something that we get to share. And we're right. also in beautiful Dry Creek, which is has the cool nights and then the warm days. So you get that diurnal shift, which yeah. is why we're still here too, because that helps grow really special fruit. So we can, 
and we have to start with really great fruit to make wine but, uh, yeah, last. But, like yeah. this, so. and, and to jump in, we're known for Zinfandel, but we're really known for our style of Zinfandel. And this is where Tannin actually plays a big role in this because- Huge role, huge yes. role. We are, if you want to say it, we do obsess. We obsess on Tannin, mm -hmm. we obsess on the um, texture because our wine style is more nostalgic of the old school style. So it's moderate alcohol, it's meant to age, it's meant to pair with food. So tannin is huge in that. We don't have highly tannic bitter wines. We really manage tannins. And part of it is the balancing act between having moderate alcohols in and nice texture. And we're always obsessing on that. And texture can come from alcohol, but a lot of it does come from tannin, the OQUs, your maceration, your extraction, the vineyard practices, all that. And really, we always try to achieve this really bright, refreshing, texturally round, but dry and moderate alcohol Zinfandel, which, you know, at premium Zinfandel. So, uh, you know, a lot of the times we all know we can get a bottle of Zinfandel off the grocery store shelf. And it's not, you know, it's going to be flabby because the tannins aren't there. There's residual sugar. It might be texturally like big, but it's not going to have the, 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 the sweet spot tannins that we really obsess on. Well, and this is where I think your history plays just absolutely a critically important role. You have five generations of folks that have walked these vineyards or a fifth one that's uh, I think you have to go pick up from school later on this afternoon. <laughs> There's, yeah, but, but they were, they're in the vineyards. <laughs> they're yeah. in the vineyards. So I want to draw attention to that because this is, in, until I did probably hours of research this week on tannin, I assumed it was basically a byproduct of the vine, you know, the vine's age, and then fermentation processes, and then also soils. And so, you know, we hear on the Napa side, Howell Mountain produces very tannic wines. And some regions produce less tannic wine. But it wasn't until I started doing all the research, particularly for this episode, and Andrew, this is where you've set me on the right path to where tannins change throughout each day in the vineyard. And the fact that you guys are walking the vineyard rows every single day and biting into grapes, and you know through generations what the flavor profile that the null style is after, you know that if it's going to be a particular year in the vineyard, what you're going to have to do in the production side of things. And you mentioned uh, fermentation and April, you mentioned extraction. So how does the fermentation process work? Let me back up. I have this bottle of Null Big Ranch, right? Spectacularly smooth, 60-40 Zinfandel Cabernet blend. Not overly tannic even though there's some Cabernet in there. And so you both know what you want this to taste like in the bottle, but you have to kind of backwards all the way to the springtime growing season and figure that out and piecemeal it together. Give me an, a glimpse of what that process looks like. We could start in the vineyard at sampling. We're about to come into harvest here. So not yet, but um, pretty soon we'll start um, uh, sampling the grapes, probably just for ourselves. We'll start tasting them and we'll start uh, kind of getting a grasp on where they are at. And, and what um, are you looking for when you bite into it? And in maturity, grape seed maturity. Um, you're getting the, the you're, you're not just, you're, you know, you're tasting the acids, you're tasting the flavors, you're tasting like what level they're at. You know, right now they're going to be bitter as all heck because they're green and not ripe. But um, I bet Andrew could pick, I bet Andrew could pick the old vine block just purely based on taste without numbers. You know, we don't, and we get the numbers because that's what you do, but I bet anything he could pick the grapes based on, I mean, we do that basically, <laughs> but without any numbers, without, we would be probably, he would be completely confident in saying, let's pick well, based on taste. I'm, I'm trying, I don't want the green tannins when, yeah. I'm, when I'm biting into it, because you can taste in the vineyard, you can taste a, a green bitterness as you're tasting the berries, as you're walking and you have to walk through the vineyard and walk pretty much the whole vineyard if you have, and if you can, and or walk multiple rows to get a feel for the overall, especially with Zen, uneven, uneven ripening. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm looking for that ripe fruit, that Zen berry where Zen kind of tastes in the vineyard what it's gonna taste like in the winery. Cabernet kind of has that where, say, Pinot doesn't taste as much like 
Pinot, when it, that's why it's kind of mysterious, but Zin has that bright Zinberry, um, Bramble, Raspberry, um, Boysenberry, more like out in the vineyard. It depends if you taste the fruit early in the morning or when it's kind of baking. When it, If you're tasting it right now, it's about 92 out here and it'll, it'll have that, it'll have more of that heated pie flavor. And so that could kind of hide some of the greenness. So you want to taste it earlier in the morning when you would be picking it because um, you're harvesting at the break of dawn, um, at least for Zen, for us, the old fashioned way, we don't have any lights. So we just pick right first thing, um, but that's in the vineyard. Even but if you, Even if you get it right in the vineyard where you're picking it and you've tasted it and you're like, okay, there, this is not astringent. This is not green pepper. This is not bitter. Let's pick. You're still not out of harm's way because if you have a heavy press and that type of thing, you can go too far. So walk us through when you pick at optimal ripeness in the morning, then you bring it into the fermentation area. What's the next stage? Well, then once we As get we in there, the then tannin. we put it on. The, we're sorting it. Well, we kind of pre-sort. We sort multiple times. So we're going to sort out in the vineyard by hand, cut off any green clusters or um, shriveled stuff or anything. And then once we're picking it, then we're sorting it in the bin right in the vineyard. Then we bring it into the winery and we dump it on a, a sorting table that's not on a moving. One one day we took, a, we spent nine hours to sort four times. We'll just sort, uh, hand sort again there. So that's pretty much triple sorted. Uh, and then we'll destem it and it'll go into the tank. And then once it either goes in the open top, then we have these 30 year old open top tanks, or we'll go into small picking bins. Then we'll kind of sort out any stems in there too. So that's almost um, and, more sorting. And you're sorting out the stems because the stems are also able to impart tannin, but those would be really, really bitter tannins, correct? Yeah, depending on that, because we're picking on the right at the peak of ripeness, the um, skin, the stems will be a little more green. Um, if you pick really ripe, they'd kind of be dried up and brown and they wouldn't impart any of that green texture. So uh, we have to get any of the green any, it depends on the year, but yeah, whatever greenness we can get, um, we get out at that point. Um, cause then we'd go into a cold soak and we sort for about our, our soak for about three days. So that's where you're going to get a lot of the flavor and tannin and fruity esters coming out before you get the active fermentation and the alcohol where the alcohol will be the, the solvent that will extract the bitter, uh, seed tannins, um, more. So you want to get that fruit flavor extracted before you got some of the high, I mean, not higher, but like when you have 13 or 14, 13% alcohol, you're still extracting some seed tannins. But if you have 15 or 16%, you're really going to go, that alcohol is going to go towards the seeds. And um, the seed tannins has the bitterness. The seed, the seed tannins have more of the bitterness. Yeah. So that's where when we go into pressing, we press sometimes before complete dryness. And it's really key. Our, our, our pressing is only my dad and, and I do it along with, and so um, in one seasonal helper. Uh, so we we test every year is different that we check our, we're the only ones pressing it. So I would never press anything without, I would have to check everything. Um, so that's kind of where the gatekeepers for that bitterness, which happens on that, that bladder, the bladder press that we talked about that the, um, is a really delicate. Uh, we press very, very minimally. Bladder press. I think I was telling you, Martin, that with the amount of wine, a lot of other producers could probably get twice as much wine from the amount of grapes that we take in because we don't press heavy. Now yeah. that's, that's a very interesting point. So and we've had like five interesting points as it relates to null. Uh, first of all, you've got four or five generations walking these rows, testing for tannic ripeness every single day, picking at optimal ripeness, hand sorting in the vineyard, hand sorting at the fermentation facility. And now we're talking about pressing. And Pressing is interesting because if you're using a, a, a bladder press, like you mentioned, it's just a giant bladder. So this thing inflates, goes down and pushes on the grapes. But to your point, April, you guys have a very light hand because if you push too hard, you will press into the seeds and that's, and the seed can explode and impart really bitter, terrible tannins. But there's a lot of wineries out there that will just press the heck out of it because they'll get twice as much juice. That's, that's and, correct. And um, it, talking about the five generations, I mean, I think there's actually Doug, his dad, who founded Nall. He is very sensitive to bitterness. 
And so he's always at the press, always constantly yeah. like glass under the press, like yeah. tasting. He's like, almost yeah. there. Okay, a little more. And then right when he hits it, he knows when to sleep. He knows when to stop. You know, and he it's it's a it's a it's a palate. It's a it's like almost like it's a a null palate. You 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 have to like live it. Well, they have these tasting strips to go down a slight rabbit hole that was developed at the university or maybe there's generic but ones now, but the university of florida where they developed whether you're a taster a super, a super taster or a non-taster and so um Doug's a super super, uh, super tasters are more sensitive to bitter and then kind of medium people can take take it or leave it and they, a good way to an, an, an analogous to uh ipas versus pilsners because everybody can relate to beers where some people can tolerate an ipa and other people wouldn't only want to stick to light beers. So technically, and it's the same with wine that people who are would never step near an IPA are kind of could be considered super tasters and you can test different levels or if people are non-tasters, they'll just pretty much be okay with everything. Um, so that's something I, cool. To I, have to be a, I have to be a super taster then because I cannot stand IPS. <laughs> yeah, either that or I, I i'm leaning more towards the fact that i'm allergic to wheat so and those okay, things are over the top. <laughs> yeah yeah I, I would love to go with super taster though uh <laughs> i think it's also interesting as your dad is just sitting there and he has the magic sense with regards to when it's null ready as it relates to tannic ripeness boy i hope he never gets the cold during harvest i mean because <laughs> that would be perfect. Well, it, well, it, Andrew That's actually we had, I would say I'm, Andrew has the DNA. I, I, I want to think I'm a, yeah. yeah, super, super taster. And, uh, but I, I, I am, I wouldn't drink a lot of IPA either, but uh, it's just, I, I want to play with making the wines more savory. I'm, I'm okay with some savoriness to balance some of the fruitiness. Yeah, I, I toe the line with the texture because that's another thing that where we go back on, um, before the press, we, we didn't mention maceration. So we were out in the vineyard and then the maceration is the actual fermentation. And so we call it a pump over or it's punching down. And we also don't pump over. Wait, or, define or, that, define, define maceration for us. What maceration is, it is just the process? extraction. Is it a, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, ma maceration is um, the movement of the must um, during the, the stage when the yeast are converting the glucose uh, to ethanol and okay. they're they're taking in oxygen and over. glucose and they're ex <laughs> and they're excreting out ethanol and and carbon dioxide so that's the maceration that's what's happening with the berry do you do that mechanically with a pump over or is it is it just a a chemistry occurrence maceration Actually, because we have these open top fermenters that are, are wide, um, we're getting a lot of juice to skin contact and it's releasing CO2. If we don't have really full fermenters, about three tons, because they could hold four tons. And so, but just to keep the yeast circulated, so they're touching all the glucose uh, and fructose that we're, we're, we're pumping over for a few minutes uh, up till, um, sometimes three times a day when they're it's a really active fermentation but sometimes two um two times per day and then up to about 50 percent of the the sugar is fermented or i say glucose fructose is the sugars that are fermented before we kind of cut it down because then that's where you could get some heavier uh tannin extraction because you're starting to build it up the alcohol at that point see this is so, where i think it's, it's honestly this is where i think you're 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 juggling swords <laughs> Because you have, you've, you've picked up the perceived appropriate ripeness in the vineyard. Now you bring it, bring it back to the facility and you've got maceration, you've got pump overs, then you've got the bladder press. And if you go too far, you get too much green bitterness. And I mean, it's a delicate balancing act. If there's nothing formulaic about this and it changes every single year based upon what mother nature gives you in the vineyard. Right. Yeah. We, we don't pick at the same time each year. And sometimes we have white grapes coming at the same time as we have red grapes or we have everything being, last year we had everything picked almost in seven days yeah. and that was uh, f uh, 50 tons came in in uh, 10 days. So that's fast. For a small winery, yeah. that was pretty intense. And uh, that's why some people at bigger wineries they have to turn over tanks, for, uh, ferment quicker or hold off on certain picks or buy more tanks or but then you, then one year everything kind of is spread out and, yeah um so that is that is why gonna, every year yeah i'm gonna go uh 
geeky and technical for a second, but I also would like to welcome Brent. I did not rec um, welcome you, Del uh, Dahlia. And I, who else did I see there that I hadn't seen in a long time? Karen, hello, Karen, good to see you again. And Larry, who was a guest a couple of weeks back. Uh, let's talk about flavonoids because there's a lot of people that are texting me and blowing up my phone going, please talk about flavonoids. Uh, there's, there's no one has ever texted me that. <laughs> You're like, what kind of friends do you better? Friday night, flavonoids. <laughs> All right, so, but this is important as a foundational building block for tannin. And there's three main ones. One of them, flavanols, flavanols is the sunscreen aspect of protecting the grape uh, because they're the ones that are gonna be doing color enhancement. The second one is the name I always have trouble with, anthocyanins. They're colored monomers responsible in large part for the color of the wines. And then flavanols, OLS as opposed to ALS, are the building bricks of tannins, also known as paranthocyanidins, and they are important to stabilize color, protect the wine against oxidation. And I think it's important when you are talking about protecting the wine against oxidation, because we all know that a lot of wines we like to age. So this is where tannins come in as it relates to aging a wine. So walk us through how tannins impact aging and oxidation. This is the really cool part of wine is where um, to distill it down is that you do have tannins that, like you were saying before, that basically you have some that only act for color or pigment, and then you have other that only act for the structure or the um, that mouthfeel and and the the tannin tannic um, or the polyphenols that help with the aging because they're also not only do they they help the wine age, but they're also antioxidant, they, they pick up oxygen, they're oxygen scavengers, so they prevent the wine from oxidizing. They, they kind of do play both sides of the fence. And so as the wine ages, a wine with more tannin, um, the reason it becomes silkier and smooth is because those tannins or the polyphenols or the phenols to start bind together and they get heavier. And so they get silkier because you feel that weight because you have more subunits and you, you'll feel that on your on your palate and then you'll think that it's smoother because smoother ones have heavier are heavier more polymeric tannins so when the when the wines are younger those tannins have them bound together and sort of dancing all around and you'll feel all that tingly maybe drying or um different kind of sensations where that you go that wine's young or it needs to age and so um that's the benefit of laying a wine down let's say if you tasted it young and you had that those tannic bites that potentially you could get a more pleasurable experience if you laid it down, but you, you kind of have to judge if those tannins were sweet in the beginning or, or really green. Sometimes that green, the greenness, if they're young tannins might never, that, that'll still be there, but you would get maybe a little more smoothness. Um, it, it always depends on this kind of what kind of cellaring you have, how long, and what varietal, like you were talking about. But um, for example, a Zinfandel or a Pinot, you'd think, couldn't age as long as a Cabernet, but the tannins play a role in it, but also the acidity because um, the pH and the, the wine chemistry matters along, they play off the tannins as well. That's something to think about. But for example, you have like a Nebbiolo, it can be really tannic and can age a long time. And because it has tannin, but it also has a lower pH and higher acid. So you're, you're playing right. off that where if a Pinot had less tannin um, and I had a higher pH, it wouldn't age as long. But then you could have a, I'm just giving, throwing out one more example and then I'll, I'll let other people talk, but like the, uh, like Cabernet has a lot of tannin. So even if it had a high pH, it could, it could age longer. And then if it, it would add more tannin as a Cabernet and had a lower pH, then it could probably age even another 10 years. Um, well, and I think you're, you're right because you look at say Burgundy, for example, an aged Pinot Noir and DRCs and things of that nature that are 20, 25 years and 30 years before release. And they're still tasting magical and silky because of the pH acid, but they're not very tannic to begin with. So it, it all weaves together. Uh, I want you to diagram this because this is kind of a grape and this is where the phenolic classes come from. And really I want, there's gonna be a spelling question later for the group on hydroxyacinamides. 
So walk us through kind of this diagram on where we talked about flavonols and anthocyanins, but this is where you get your tannin. So the main tannin, yeah, is coming from this, the skin and um, it also, anthocyanins are technically the color, but you're obviously getting that because in a red wine, you're getting a pink color from the, or pink in the rosé, but in a dark purple or a ruby red from the skins. Um, so those are, anthocyanins are, are separate from the flavanol, nols and nols that are phenolics in the wine that are also the tannin. So the tannin, we, we also separate into condensed tannin because that's not hydrolyzable and that will stay in the wine. Once it's in there, that's the, the, the stuffing of the wine that came from the skins during, because of the varietal, because of the maceration, because of the pressing and those won't go anywhere. So, and that is that sensation of where the seeds again are the bitterness, but then the skins are also right. the, the drying. So those are those flavanols and then the flavin three alls is because it's where the, the, um, the alcohol is on those rings and the um, phenol, phenolic rings that are bound up. Um, so the hydroxycinamates are uh, mostly, they're in red grapes, but we talk about more of those in white grapes because the, you're just pressing and a lot of the structure of a white grain, uh, white wine is, has to do with the hydroxycinamates. Um, uh, that's what creates the flavor in a white wine. Um, and then you get the the oak flavor if you use that for the more of the tan in a white wine. But um, so that's well, it, it's separated. Yeah, we had a, we had a quiz question about uh, tannins in white and red wine, and that was correctly answered by Bill B, uh, who I won't say his last name. One of the best wine fans we have. Uh, but I like the fact that you can get tannins from skins, from oak, from the age of the vine. What else imparts tannin? Soils. So, uh, soils are, I mean, that's just going to be that the way that the vines ripen or the berries bring in through the, they bring in glucose through the, uh, the leaves, but uh, pretty much tannin we're talking about is pretty much coming from the, the seeds and the skins uh, as far as, and the, and that varietal makeup and how that's different. Um, I, I believe the soil is kind of more the acidity and the ester and a lot of the flavors, because when you get that glucose fermented to ethanol or alcohol, and then you combine that with the acidity of the natural environment and that, that terroir, if you're talking about just soil, um, then you're getting more of the aromatics. And, and then that climate is a lot of the, yeah, a lot of that kind of flavor. So the, really the tannin is the, the actual nuts and bolts of the wine. That's the physical aspect of like we were saying, bring it into the winery and, and sorting through it and the maceration and how much you decide to extract. So uh, I would say that soil is, is, is beneficial for where you plant that particular varietal. Um, it's, and it's, I mean, you're right. You said earlier, certain varietals have more tannins. Obviously Beaujolais Nouveau, it's meant to be drunk young. So there's very little tannins on that, but it's still a fun wine. But then you've got Nebbiolos, you've got Syrah, you've got Cabernet Sauvignon that have a significant amount of tannins. And as it relates to soil, we've got limestone, clay, silt, loam, volcanic. I mean, all in your backyard. And it, it brings up a poll question because not many people besides you two know this answer. And there are... 12 soil orders as recognized by the National Cooperative Soil Survey. How many of the 12 are in Napa and Sonoma? Anybody want to start humming the Jeopardy music? I'm fine with that. No, no, hey, hey, you many, guys can't answer. How many, the, uh, how, how many like, of the 12? Okay, actually, yeah. Can I Google this? I Probably could. like 11. <laughs> hey, hey, no answering from the guests, please. Uh, that breaks precedent. Uh, so just to give you a little background information, you have your order, your suborder, your great group, subgroup, family, and then you can't see my hand all the way down here, series. Hey, you can't answer both questions, people. I don't like the new Zoom. Could someone get me Zoom headquarters on the phone, please? I don't like how they do it. <laughs> all right. So the answer to the first question is... 
six. There are 12 soil orders in the world, ladies and gentlemen. Six of them are in wine country between Sonoma and Napa. I mean, it's incredible. There are 33 series of soils in wine country, Sonoma and Napa, uh, which is insane. The largest influencer on tannin is grape skin, grape seed, oak barrel, extraction process, vine age. I technically don't know the answer to this, I am going to rely on Andrew and April, and we will verify it later. All wrong answers, we'll have to ante up with $50 for next week's episode. It's a really a gentleman's game. So we're gonna do this. And Lori, don't think I didn't see your comment question, quat me. I'm, I'm after you, I'm following you. Uh, all right, largest influence on Tannin. Andrew, take it away. It might be all of these, might be none of these. It could be almost a tie because of the, the grape skin is inherent. That's another thing why the soil is really important because where you plant the, the grapes is kind of is based on the soil. And so that's why in the old days when they didn't have irrigation, they would really be choosing the soil type. And that's why Zinfandel did so well out here because it is so dry in the summer. And so it could thrive out here and then you could mix it with the petite sera for tannin. So um, for me, the varietal, is the most important because if you're working say with Pinot versus Cabernet, you're gonna have completely different wines. But then at the same time, what you did in the cellar, again, where you could really pull out some heavy extraction and you could super um, be super winemaker, really manipulate it and uh, throw throw some heavy press at it and you, you could pull So what's it. the answer? <laughs> so that's why I was like neck and neck, but I, I, I wanna go with inherent thing and believe in the, the sanctity of, uh, the wine world and the varietal and the, and the, and the tradition of the skin and, and what I've been taught for, um, you know, what, the, the I'll, I'll, I'll the give wine. you skin. I'll, I'll give you skin. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that actually sounds bad, but I will give you skin. <laughs> uh, we have skin in the game. <laughs> so you have skin in the game. But one of the things I did read is vine age for is a major factor in tannin. And what is interesting to me is what you just said, and this is great for all the folks that travel, you know, Napa and Sonoma. So we've learned already this evening that a large component of tannin is maceration, extraction process, and pressing. So if you take a, and we'll just pick on Howell Mountain, for example, because Howell Mountain seemingly has extremely tannic wines. Well, if you've got tannic wines from older vines and they're doing bladder press for full extraction, Yes, that's gonna be a wickedly tannic wine. So you know that going in, don't plunk down $90 a bottle because you're not gonna drink it for 30 years uh, until those tannins fall out from <laughs> Exactly. So now you have a little bit of um, kind of math to work in your head when you start asking questions on what is your extraction process? What is your fermentation process? How are you doing this? How old are the vines? That sort of stuff can all factor into the tannin management. Andrew, you had a question. I saw you raise your hand. So, so what I was saying was that, uh, or what I'm going to plan off that is that Howe Mountain is higher elevation. So I have been reading places and I can almost back, I could back that. I could find the references, but say in Mendoza or in Argentina where they have uh, Malbec, but also the Cabernet, but higher because it's sunscreen. So it's higher, it's higher elevation, closer sun, anywhere where there's already heavier ultraviolet light, the vines are going to create more tannin too. So um that again would come down to the skin and then that would be where it is located where it's hotter or it needs more protection really from the sun not well and and this is where we we won't get into it on this episode with regards to talking about irrigation because you talk about the uptake of nutrient and dry farm vines versus irrigated vines and that has an impact on tannin as well and so by the way you're getting none of this at mass produced ones zero, zero influence of tannin on mass produced wines. So that is all made in the lab. It's all made formulaically. It's the same every single time. Uh, the mass produced wines don't have their father on the cover of Wine Spectator like Andrew did. I mean, it's, it's, you're not, you're not getting this magic or grandfather. Who was it? My father. Yeah. Yeah. The, not the terrible. Bottle, hey, Julie. Bottle shot. Uh, all right. So Tannin and aging, we talked a teeny eensy width about that, but how do you know how long a null wine 
from an age worthiness standpoint is going to be when you're bottling it? What we're aiming for from when we're standing in the vineyard, we're trying to make a, at least 10 year wines where from 10 years from the vintage, it should be drinking really sound with the tannins bound together with that fruit, have that smoothness, have, have a great complexity. Um, if you want a little more fruit, you could drink it five years from vintage. Um, <clears throat> but then if you, if you build a wine or depending on the vintage that goes 15 or 20, then that's a bonus. But uh, especially with the California fruit, this has some, some, some Cabernet in it. I think it, it, it depends how patient you can, if you can withhold from uh, having a party or you just have, have enough in your cellar that you, you can have fun with seeing how long you can wait. But uh, most people want to, that's the thing. Most people want to drink them sooner. So you could, you could decant it and that oxidation will, will give the tannins a softer feel and uh, you can see how the wine evolved. So we like to say you could, buy a case or six bottles and you drink one every year at a special occasion. And we say these are weekend wines that you, you drink at a birthday or a holiday or a, uh, the special occasion where it goes with the food, of course, if you're making a big meal. And then that's where you can kind of see if these wines work with you. They have that brightness, that acidity, less, less alcohol. So it, it depends what your palate is. Again, if you're an IPA drinker or a Pilsner drinker or you're a cab drinker or a Pinot or Zin, and um, once you know that this style works for you, then you, you can roll with it. Um, yeah. we, we know that, nice. that, that not everybody's making these style of wines anymore, or this was kind of a style that was popular in the 80s, and we, we stuck with that, and we're kind of more old school California that way, where they were making bigger wines in the 70s. There's been kind of some the ebb and the flow of the cycle of what's popular just for the mass wines out there, but our style has been this kind of tried and true where it's kind of that difference between um, medium tannin, medium oak, medium alcohol. We like to think of it as medium alcohol and you get the fruit, but you still get that spiciness and you still get that varietal character. So we're really trying to give you guys the best showing of everything we can do with the grapes and where we are in, in Dry Creek that you're really tasting that Dry Creek balance where you get that acidity and that fruit because we have the sun bright hot days and then really cool nights and then you you've got these these varietals that just that you can't you can't hide from the fruit but you don't want to do, if you want fruit you could just drink welch's grape or something so we're trying to give you something that's fun from a wine drinker's perspective who's a lot of the people that follow us drink they drink they've sampled wine from all over the world they've been around the world they're they know their food and they they want to pick a wine that has the all the best of both worlds and then if you want it's, to, yeah. It, no, it, it's funny because you talk about that balancing act of, of tannin as it relates to smoothness, as it relates to wines from the 70s and 80s before they went off the charts in one direction and kind of family stylistically what you're after is not high extraction, not, you know, thick, unkish fruit bombs that are completely out of character, out of balance. And you, you marvelously, each vintage have these, incredibly smooth wines that are like this is low in alcohol i mean this is 13.9 uh this is not a crazy alcoholic wine so I'm, I'm curious actually scotland's curious how do you decide which grapes go into which wine <laughs> i mean we talk about it every day and, I, and i'm walking through the vines every day i'm walking through the winery every day i'm tasting every day if i can or every other day or at least once a week I'm going through everything and we just keep tasting, keep trial and error. And um, we do, we just nerd out on food and wine and I can't help it. I'm really, I, and we, we let, uh, at night we think about it um, while we're eating dinner, we think about it or while, well, yes. while we're working out, we think about it. So we just keep uh, every time we have a free moment. And then we kind of, once we've tasted the wines, you can kind of taste the wine so much that you, you need a little break. It's like, and maybe I'm going to go out on a limb and talk about, say, if you're doing a big painting and you're, you're painting a bunch of stuff and then you're like, okay, I'm going to go do something else. I'm going to come back to it and see if I need to add anything or, or not. Even with like, but, even but, when you're cooking some too. Some of it is simple in the fact that no. the estate old vine takes the, the estate old vine block. So, I mean, some of that is really simple. I think the master right. blend, the classic Zen has a blend of the old vine vineyard and some petite Saron Carignan. And that's where, Andrew does a lot of the, you know, um, tasting to blend. 
with his dad. So here's, yeah. and we didn't explain your roles early on. So April, tell us your role and title. Um, my role, <laughs> I'm a, uh, well, okay. Well, I am a viticulturist by trade, but a lot of, a lot of what I do now is the tasting room hospitality, um, some of the sales and stuff like that. But I'm, I guess it does come back to, we do everything. We do everything together. Um, right. I, I help wash barrels. I try to avoid that, but <laughs> sometimes I have to. Um, and then, yeah, and I help taste too. Sometimes they'll just be like, can you taste this? And I'll taste it and kind of, yeah. and I'll, from my perspective, say, oh, I, I, I can taste that or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. She does. We, we, all do, we do everything that we have to to make a make the wine carry on the tradition yeah. that we're basically taking over. I mean, we are from my parents, and they did the same thing. It was Lee and Doug, and now it's April and Andrew. Um, so yes. <laughs> we're, we're working it? really more in the vineyard. So it is true that we're there, there are certain blocks. Yeah, like April said, that I, I'm kind of not stuck with, but it's like I have I to make those Andrew. That's so it, actually, <laughs> April has to tell me. <laughs> actually, like, you, you yeah. guys can kind of tell. We just, we really geek out on wine. And so she kind of, cause she went to school in Australia. They just, the one thing she learned in Australia now, keep, like, it, simple, just keep it simple, stupid. That was the one thing they told yeah. her. So, so <laughs> we, we don't to, do uh, that though here. It's a, our motto is if it's not hard, it's not null. Cause everything we do is hands on. Yeah. Like everything we do is like. <laughs> yeah, we do, we do things the hard way here. Yeah. It's just like. Yeah. Well, let me, you, you also, from a standpoint, we talked about the impact of tannin via the vine's age. We talked about the varietal impact of tannin. What about the oak impact of tannin? There's a, you know, a difference between American oak and French oak, and you guys use French oak. Why? French oak has a more uh, delicate, I would say, finish where it's not as rambunctious and aggressive. It doesn't have that grip. The tannins are a little um, fine grained and they have kind of, it, you kind of get a little more of a sweetness out of the oak that balances the real dry acidity uh, in a wine that is has that structure or is that you choose stylistically to have that brightness. It balances that out um, really nicely, and and that and and we also have medium toast plus, or we don't have heavy toast on the on the barrels, so that um, that's slower and the less heat doesn't extract as much of that hydro hydrolyzable tannin yeah. as well. And, yeah. So that is really important as well as finishing the fermentation in the French oak barrel gives that roundness to the, uh, cause you'll see some people they'll, nowadays they'll, they'll start the fermentations in uh, oak barrels or and big oak, um, uh, wide open top oak tanks too. Cause that, the oak with the tannin and the wine will soften sooner. And so you, you're just starting that, that polymerization sooner um, when you're combining that. Um. Yeah, I mean, and we don't we, we use 25% new French oak. And so, you know, when you think about tannin, you could uh, like the neutral oak, the older barrels, we, we put we use those because they do impart tannin, but not exactly the extreme oak flavors. Yeah, so right. Getting, like structure. Okay. Is a lot of Andrew, is, is tannin the hardest thing to balance? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tannin, especially in Zinfandel, where you're picking, yeah. we have a little more acidity. You're playing off the city and the tannin because if you have too much tannin and too much acidity or acidity yeah. and no tannin, then you kind of want them to balance, oh, um, be balancing each other. Um, I would say with all a lot of the dry, just the sunshine and the what, keeping the, the alcohol lower, you have a lot of ripeness. I'm kind of balancing the ripeness with the tannin, and then if I if I don't want to pick super um, ripe, then I I'm playing running the line um, of getting underripe tannins or getting that greenness because I don't want to I don't want to I want to get the fruit before it's too ripe. So um, kind of when you you do pick a fairly at a riper style, you're kind of getting some of that softer that fruitier tannin where you're not going to get any of that hard harshness or dryness. So you have to be really careful. Um, and our wines are dry, so we don't have that kind of um, viscous residual um, effect in no. the texture. Yeah. No. So you really got well, I want to show. I want to show people a couple of things. Uh, we have to go to Google Earth uh, because it's a highlight of the program. 
And before I go to Google Earth, I just want people to look at this. That is a rosemary container. <laughs> How much is that? Please, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we have like two fifty. Is everyone paying attention? Nod your heads. Okay, so that's two dollars and fifty cents for a rosemary container. So now when we go to Google Earth, and we see what's happening. Uh, this obviously, I'm going to skip the the region that we focus on because I mentioned that at the top of the show, the Napa and Sonoma wine region, but we're going to go over to Nall. That'll get your attention after 25 coffees and a glass of wine. <laughs> so this, I, I stopped at this elevation because you can see kind of valley flourish. Uh, you have a significant amount of topographic relief. And as we're talking about soils, and, and I had a whole bunch more of, of soil cutovers and, and cross sections of soil specifically in this region, because honestly, ladies and gentlemen, this is a magical, magical, magical area as far as dirt. And it's just unprecedented to have six of the soil orders in the world of the 12 in this region. So Nall is in this beautiful tapestry and landscape down here. But if you're fortunate enough to come for a tasting, this is your view. And, and this roof right here is all rosemary. And it's also behind me. Um, and if you're fortunate enough to just sit down here, this whole thing is incredible. All rosemary. My guess is that they did not know that this would be about $3.4 million of rosemary as it relates to- <laughs> I think we're in the wrong business. <laughs> um. But I was fortunate enough with Mission Control, boy, unfortunately, it's about a year ago. We have to remedy that. To pop in and sit out here uh, with April and be among the vines and just, and, and the beautiful, and a baby, and the beautiful bocce ball court, and just sit and chill. And it really is magical. So you can see it's, it's not industrial. There's you know not factories around anywhere. It's just you, the vines, Mother Nature, and another typical bluebird day uh, with the Null family. And yeah, it's, it's fun because that is our cellar where we make everything. Yeah. It's a living roof. So the inside is a cave-like environment, which the barrels really do love to age in. But when you come and visit, we're out right behind the cellar and you really see everything that's going on. I mean, it's not like we have this nice, it's not, it's truly rustic, but we don't have like a separate tasting room somewhere else. It's all part of it. And, you, you know, that's just what we do. No, and you, and you do it pretty damn well. And it's, it's, it's farming with an unbelievable product. And, and we're the beneficiaries of that product, but it, the roof is spectacular. Whose idea was the roof? Yeah, that was, has some yeah. cool stuff. It's he really, was, um, it's um, really cool. The electricity bill for making it all of our for our winery, our working winery, is less than our house because it's naturally cool. And my tagline now is "naturally cool since 1984." Yeah. Because you go in and and it, it you could be 100 degrees out there, and you go into the, um, the cellar, and it's um, 56 60 degrees naturally yeah so naturally cool since when since 1984 <laughs> uh that was the year i graduated high school and i obviously thought i was naturally cool then so yeah. um, not very still, look at my mission control said still not cool not 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 <laughs> cool. hashtag still not cool yeah. <laughs> all right did i miss the team up on Monday? trademark that one yeah uh, awesome. It's an above ground cave. Yeah, so the, the idea is, was to have an above ground cave and and, that, and they were doing that in the 70s out in Colorado and my dad went out there and checked that out well in the early 80s and then but they started it. They were just a way to conserve when you have the, the snow and then the heat. Um, but I know it seems like a cool. It's a we have a few other people maybe doing that but yeah we're right. Well, well it's I'm really low maintenance. I mean, with the way things are going, we're pretty much going to have to be like living. Yeah, we're not going anywhere, <laughs> as they say. Yeah, you could. It's, it's not. It was. It was built right after the the earthquake and the '89 earthquake, and so they everything the state of California made you double reinforce it. So it's it's double what the original plans were supposed to be. So 
Um, well, I know we have to let April go pick up a child, but I, I wanted to let the new people know and, and everybody that joins us, we talk a little bit about what Cellar Angels is, is about and helping the limited production wineries, but basically it's about connecting all of you. And, and to us, you're heroes. And, and hero, we, we don't mean Superman. We don't mean the Mask Avengers. We don't mean any of that. Because if we go back to Aristotle's day and the Stoicism, Hero was a protector and a defender with the strength of two. And all of our customers we refer to as angels because they are defending and protecting the limited production winery. And there's nothing in our minds more important than that. So we call you wine heroes or AKA sipsters. Uh, but I wanna be fair and also bring to attention, you know, this week uh, was a pretty tragic week around America. And if we look at a couple individuals or one individual that we lost in particular, if you grew up in the Midwest and you were a product of the 70s, and of which I was, more, more 80s, but early 70s, there was a particular movie that you watched every year. And this was back in the time when if you missed the movie, you couldn't stream it. You had to wait another year for that movie to come out. Missing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or Frosty, was that was on the ground unconsolable for a year until it came out. But there was a particular movie and we lost James Caan this week. And that was a little bit heartbreaking because the movie that anybody that watched in the Midwest who was an athlete was, of course, Brian's son. And if you ever watch that movie, you will see Billy D. Williams in the role of his life and where he says, I love Brian Piccolo. And if you hit your knees tonight, pray for a more forgiving, thoughtful nation. And, and I think we need a little bit of that right now. And growing up where I grew up in Deerfield, Illinois, you know, we took care of our neighbors. We, we actually used our big wheels without helmets. We came home when the lights went on, or we tried to. But one of our neighbors was a border, and that border was with Highland Park. And I get a little bit choked up, obviously, but all of our angels to Highland Park, I'm raising a glass to you. Sure. Cheers, because uh, that was very painful. We know a lot of folks there, so peace out to them. But let's end on a high note, shall we? because we are going to be in wine country next week. And next week you can follow along with us uh, at the Instagram, which is going to be, I believe, in the chat at the Cellar Angels Instagram handle. And it is gonna be a lot of fun because you're gonna be seeing behind the scenes, how the sausage is made, how the tannin is actually decided upon, I, I think. I don't know if we're gonna get that far because it is harvest. Uh, I'm gonna pour a glass right now and raise a glass to April and Andrew for walking us through an incredibly complex topic because tannin is so diverse and so meaningful at the end product. You guys nailed it. And so we can't thank you enough for the time you spent this evening and the wines that you produce. Awesome, awesome job. Thanks guys. Yeah, Thanks I, do, I do wanna say something. I re we really mm -hmm. do appreciate all of you guys because mm -hmm. you guys are the ones, there's so much out there. It's the consumer choice and you guys are choosing to support mm -hmm. the small family wineries and that is how we all keep going. And that's really, 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 uh, you guys are the biggest part of this. So I, we really mm -hmm. do appreciate you guys choosing all, choosing other small um, producers mm -hmm. that aren't like huge corporate conglomerates that, um, you know, you're, you're really supporting mm -hmm. this, the, the small family business all across, you know, America. Yeah, it's, it's meaningful, important. You are indeed wine heroes. On a housekeeping announcement, we are off next week because we will be in wine country with fine folks like April and Andrew. Uh, and continuing the theme here, in two weeks, we'll be back with another viticulturalist, Lise Asimov. So we're going to be talking. No, I, have no said, I love Lise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So you guys be good to one another. I think we can all agree the world needs a whole heck of a lot more kindness and good wine. So cheers. Have a good meal. Have Wonderful a good meal. Cheers. Good wine. Thanks yeah. all. Thanks yeah. guys.